Again, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third um, interview in the in our series of conversations um, celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the EU guidelines on the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief in the EU. My name is Anastasia Hartman. I, um, I'm from Open Doors International, but today I am representing APRIT, uh, the European platform against uh, religious um, discrimination and intolerance. We are joined today by a special guest, um, Dr. Andrea Benzo, who is Italy's first ever special envoy on um, freedom, on the protection of uh, freedom of religion or belief and interreligious dialogue. He has been in his office since June 2022. Andrea, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Anastasia. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you today. Um, just let me give let me give our participants a quick introduction of your profile, and then we can continue with um, with some questions that uh, that we have prepared for you. And I also want to encourage our participants if you would like to ask a question to our speaker, please feel free to use uh, the Q and A button. Um, normally, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, throughout the conversation as well as closer to the end where we have time reserved for Q&A. But um, yeah, like I said, feel free to do that even before that. So um, yeah, Dr. Andrea Benzo, like I said, the first um, Italy Special Envoy for Forb into Religious Dialogue. Prior to that, uh, he served in um, two Italian embassies in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, and in Cairo, in Egypt. Now while in Rome, um, or uh, during his career in Rome, he worked as the deputy European correspondent, uh, which was in the years of 2011 to 2012, and as a counselor within the policy planning department um, in, year, in the years of 2021 to 22. Um, in terms of his academic achievements, he holds a PhD in canon and ecclesiastical law. Um, so Andrea, to kick off our interview, being the very first special envoy on Forb and interreligious dialogue in Italy, how challenging, how challenging, or on the other hand, how easy has it been for you to launch the work on the protection of Forb, um, yeah, in your country on behalf of Italy? Thank you again for uh, this opportunity. I'm very grateful to the platform for having this chance to share some thoughts with you on uh, our common file, since we are all. Uh, say, practitioners in, in the same field. Uh, well, I have to say that I, I didn't feel my task was particularly difficult. And the first reason is because I, I actually didn't start from scratch at all. Italy's engagement in the field of uh, full protection and uh, in the promotion of interfaith dialogue has been longstanding. And our track record is, uh, is uh, I, I would say very, very, very good in this regard. Uh, this is part of our history, and we could uh, explain this uh, through uh, the history of our relations with the Catholic Church. In general, the fact that we have de developed over centuries this special relationship with, uh, uh, with the relig religious institution has made, up, has made us very sensitive, very open to the religious dimension in life in general, both in its uh, private dimension and in its uh, public one. So um, the ministry and Italy at large have been active in this field for, uh, for decades. You can have different forms, different uh, solutions to let's say uh, give shape to this engagement but uh, the, the main goal remains the same. So I, I had the feeling I, let's say, was able to continue a long-standing tradition that was there. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, I don't want to look uh, too much focus on my personal experience, but uh, of course, my, my PhD, my university studies were extremely helpful for someone who had to, to let's say, start a new role and in this regard, I value very much my relation with the, with the academia. I think that for, uh, let's say, nascent uh, fields of activity like, uh, like um, let's say, the geopolitics of religion, or more in general, the understanding of our religion 
interacts with uh, with foreign policy, our relations with uh, with the academia is uh, is extremely valuable. And the same goes for our relation with with civil society. I really believe it's a teamwork where everybody has a role to to play, and our synergy can really help us uh, achieve our, our common objectives. So to answer your question, it was not particularly difficult. I had the feeling I was uh, continuing something that was, uh, was already there. But you know, having, uh, uh, having a name and having a specific role was something we were uh, working on for, uh, for some time. And as you probably know, um, the role was established up after a resolution was adopted in the Italian parliament. Uh, a resolution that was adopted unanimously to call on the government to strengthen our engagement on for protection and the promotion of interfaith dialogue. So also having this very broad and consistent political support was extremely helpful to, to, to start my, my new job. Right. So, and as far as I understand, there is an important qualifying element to your work indeed, that is your mandate concerns not only FORB, but the interlink between FORB, interfaith dialogue, but also religious engagement. Could you perhaps tell us more about that? What dimension does this add to your work at the moment? Yeah, well, the idea is between this combination between FORB protection and the promotion of interfaith dialogue um, is that uh, we, we, we look at FORB not uh, as a purely intergovernmental file, but as a, as a broader objective that should be attained through, uh, let's say, all available tools and through partnerships. And these partnerships, as I mentioned, are not only those among like-minded countries that are extremely helpful, of course, to advance our common goals, but also partnerships between governments uh, religious actors, and as I mentioned, the civil society at large. So we look at interfaith dialogue as a tool conducive to uh, better promotion of form. Uh, you know, sometimes interfaith dialogue is, uh, is dismissed by some as a, as a fault opportunity, uh, let's say as an empty exercise. Well, this may be true, precisely when interfaith dialogue is not framed within the broader framework of human rights. But when this happens, uh, and when interfaith dialogue is conducted not only with leaderships, but also with the grassroots levels, then you can really have better results. The principle here is that, uh, as, you, as you all know, uh, four violations do not only come from uh, governmental action, but also from, from society, from social esteem. And uh, one of the ways we can uh, um, fight against social hostility is by, by promoting closer contacts and very practical, very concrete cooperation between people uh, belonging to different, uh, to different faiths. So when they see that uh, religious difference is not an obstacle to cooperation when they see that despite their uh, belonging to different faiths, they have the same aspirations and work together to achieve uh, these goals, then you, uh, you are better placed to remove those, uh, uh, those obstacles, that the, the mistrust, the skepticism, the hostility that, uh, that still exist uh, in, in many parts of the world between people of, uh, of different religious affiliation. So interfaith dialogue seen as a tool, um, let's say conducive to, to a better form, uh, form environment. And religious engagement is based on the need to talk to and to interact with religious actors also on matters related to form. In general, religious engagement is, you know, whatever, uh, entails an interaction between uh, uh, secular institutions and religious actors on a number of, of files, uh, not all of them related to religion. Uh, a very popular file now under the interfaith head is, uh, is um, environment protection, for example. You can have education, you can have uh, youth empowerment, human empowerment, poverty eradication. So in all what we do, we try to always have religious actors in the picture. 
and having this, uh, you know, uh, I mean, being familiar with one another will also help us advance forward when fork is at stake. Great. You mentioned a lot about the engagement of civil society in your work, and of course, from my side uh, as an NGO, and I'm pretty sure from other colleagues who are on this call, it's very encouraging to hear that, you know, you want to work with civil society, and that's an important link for you when you discuss FORP issues, and that's indeed very important, and I would like to come back to that a little bit later in our interview, and maybe first, um, since the um, yeah, the conversation is dedicated to the uh, celebration of the EU guidelines and their 10th anniversary on the protection of freedom of religion or belief. Um, maybe to um, yeah to steer it into this direction, these guidelines. How effective or useful do you find this document um, in your work and in your past experience? Maybe even at the embassies um, of Italy in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, whether um, yeah. The, the document has been useful for you and in what way? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a great initiative by the EU 10 years ago when the EU for guidelines were adopted. I was somehow also part of this work uh, uh, as deputy European correspondent because at the time, of course, it, this was uh, discussed within uh, within the, foreign, the EU foreign policy track. And, um, and I remember that Italy played an active role in, uh, towards the, the adoption of these of this guidelines. So we, we contributed to, to the preparation of this text. And then uh, absolutely, yeah, while I was in, uh, in uh, Riyadh and Cairo, the EU for guidelines uh, popped up quite frequently in our activities as part of the EU family. Uh, there were EU delegations in both countries, so coordination was uh, um, was done by, by the EU delegations in, in Riyadh and in Cairo. And uh, yeah, the topic was part of our, uh, if not daily job, but was definitely part of our activities on a regular basis. Uh, I think that the main aim that uh, was achieved at that time, and uh, this is something for what uh, uh, our guidelines are still extremely helpful, uh, is, uh, is a literacy purpose. I still see that in, we need to uh, raise awareness, even, uh, uh, even among diplomats, on the relevance of FORB to whatever we do. So what I've been trying to do in this past year as, uh, as the special envoy of the ministry was to streamline FORB issues and interfaith issues uh, in our daily work. The, the, let's say, the general tendency would be to link forward only to, let's say, uh, religious issues or to uh, confine forward to very specific situations or meetings or counterparts. Uh, whereas the real challenge is to um, show that forward pops up in under many circumstances and in many cases during our activity. Uh, four violations, for example, are a development issue. Development is hampered where, when four is not respected. But this link is not clear to everyone. Another, mis another common mistake is to think that uh, advancing four means, uh, uh, means having a partisan agenda, that you defend some and not others, or uh, you, let's say you have uh, personal convictions that goes in, in a certain direct direction and not in another, which is also not, not the right way to look at fall. Fall protection is a universal need uh, everywhere in the world. And it's, I would say, a non-partisan issue. It's in everybody's interest, government, civil society, religious actors, to, to, to have fall respected everywhere as a matter of stability, of prosperity, of, of human rights, of equality. So the real challenge is to streamline all of this in what we do on a daily basis. And I have seen during this past year that a lot of colleagues were asking me questions, were, were asking for a specific contributions in, in, uh, in view of meetings they, they would have. And this shows that uh, 
the let's say the the, the, the cross cutting relevance of form is is finally you know appreciated. Yeah. And one of the main purposes of EU guidelines is, is probably this one to to increase the literacy level of uh, of our diplomats. Right. Right. Andrea, you mentioned uh, a few challenges that you have encountered in your work in terms of implementation of the EU guidelines, but maybe on the other, on the other hand, on a positive note, have you witnessed or taken part in any successful examples of implementation of the EU guidelines? Could you maybe share a bit more on that? Yes, well, absolutely. In, uh, in both countries where I served, I, uh, I had, uh, I and the ambassadors at the time, uh, we had several meetings with, uh, with religious actors. We had meetings with the uh, civil society engaged in, um, in the FOB domain. And we were always raising uh, this topic uh, with, with our interlocutors. Uh, there were demarches done, um, statements uh, every now and then. And I mean, I, I, I've seen much of what is foreseen in, uh, in the EU guidelines. Uh, uh, let's say implemented uh, in, uh, during my experience uh, abroad. And as Italy, when I was in Cairo in February 2020, that was one of our last activities uh, before the pandemic uh, erupted, we organized uh, um, a, the first, probably the first uh, um, open doors conference on FOB in the country, hosted by, by Italy. Uh, at that time, we, we invited uh, a number of uh, foreign counterparts. And, uh, uh, and actually, at that time, there was no EU special envoy because uh, uh, Mr. Fiegel had um, terminated his mandate uh, a couple of months before the conference, and there was no successor at that point. But he attended as, as former EU envoy. Um, we had uh, OSCE people, uh, UN people, uh, um, the EU head of delegation in Cairo, part of, of this event. And that was a way also to, again, mainly to, to stress our commitment to FORB and to show that, again, it's a collective effort that has to involve uh, local governments, uh, civil society, religious actors, international partners. It, it was a very successful event. And, and the, main, the main goal was uh, to, to initiate some concrete work on this uh, on this uh, track, and to let people understand uh, how important for protection is uh, to achieve a number of goals that are common to to all of us, even if uh, uh, at first glance they're not directly related to to form itself. So the public diplomacy component, I think, which is mentioned in in the EU guidelines. Uh, is, uh, is a very relevant one to our, to our job. Right. Okay. And as I, as I said, I, I would like to go back to the, um, to the question of engagement with civil society. Before I move on to our next question, I wanted to um, yeah, encourage the participants to ask the questions in the, um, in the chat. And I actually see that there is one um, question at the moment. Yeah, maybe we could first um, um, discuss, the, discuss the one that has been asked by Joseph Young and then um, yeah, move on to what I wanted to ask you. So Andrea, how can uh, the EU guidelines promote the importance of freedom of religion and cooperation with human rights groups that may have conflicting perspectives on human rights? Yeah, well, I think um, that the, the first part of the EU guidelines is, is helpful in this regard. When, uh, when it is mentioned that uh, FOB must be seen <clears throat> as part of the, of the whole set of human rights. And we, are also, we all, always have to rely on the interrelatedness, interdependence and universality of human rights. So uh, in the end, there should be no conflict because uh, we should look at, at the human being as a single entity. And if, uh, if one right is, uh, is not respected, uh, then also uh, the other rights are, uh, are under pressure. And when uh, FOB, let's say, is uh, instrumentalized or used against uh, other fundamental rights, uh, 
it's, uh, I mean, this is not really folk. I mean, form in its uh, genuine interpretation could never be in conflict with other fundamental rights. What happens is, uh, uh, in this case, is that religion itself is being used uh, to, for example, uh, consolidate power, to keep, um, a, let's say, a stronger pos position in, uh, in the legal system, for example, or in the political system. So from my point of view, uh, the main reference should always be the universality, interdependence and interrelatedness of, of human rights where all of them reinforce one another. And part of our religious engagement should also be to, let's say, um, uh, overcome all those situations where religion is instrumentalized for political purposes. Of course, it's easier said than done, it's all it's, it's a whole world of, uh, of different situations that unfold uh, in many parts of the world. But uh, sometimes religious actors are instrumentalized themselves. They're put under pressure, they're being put under pressure. And their relation with, uh, with the foreign counterparts, both governments and civil society, may also help empower them to, let's say, get a stronger stance vis-a-vis -vis their, their national governments. Again, it's, not, it's absolutely not an easy task. It's something that you will get over time and after quite a long amount of, of, of time. But I think it's still worth uh, the effort. There is another question asked to you, Andrea, by uh, Rachel Forster. What role do you see for ambassadors or special envoys of um, individual member states, such as yourself, in the implementing of EU guidelines particularly now that the EU has its own special envoy for FORB? Yes, I mean, um, teamwork is, uh, is, is very important in our, in our case. Um, as you know, not all uh, EU member states have uh, uh, people designated uh, to, to have this role. So this makes our, uh, let's say, coordination even more, uh, more important. Uh, Ambassador Vandele was uh, part of an event, a closed door event that we organized in, uh, in Italy in March. I think it was probably one of his first uh, official trips abroad in, uh, in his new role. And um, I can see a lot of synergy that we can, uh, that we can harness in, uh, in doing this. And uh, I have very good relations with all my EU counterparts. Uh, the good thing is that we meet in different formats. So formats are different. Uh, the focus of each one is different, but it's mainly the same people. Uh, in this case, I mean, this is the positive side of being a small group. Normally, we want, uh, let's say, the full family to, to grow, which is, uh, which is our common goal. Um, focusing on uh, special employees, I think that our teamwork, being an, again a small group of pe people, um, help us very much to, to get familiar with one another, to share uh, information, to coordinate on, on common steps, to do things together. I think there is a very good uh, synergy, mainly because we all face the same problems. And one of those problems is the, uh, let's say, the low literacy levels that we still uh, that we still see at home. So, based on this common need, uh, I think it's even easier to to build synergy. And there is another question. Um, Ari Dipater noted that your mandate has both an internal and external focus. For the EU special envoy, the focus is just external. Um, and yesterday we have we had an interview with Professor Anikina, and he identified it as a weakness for the European Special Envoy in FORB or for the FORB ecosystem in Europe in general, that it's just the external element. Would you agree with this? And if so, how um, how could we go about that? Yeah, good question. Um, as a general statement, I would say that consistency between FORB levels uh, domestically and for protection internationally is key to make sure that we are credible when we engage our foreign partners on FOB. Uh, 
if this was not the case, uh, uh, our message would be would be much weaker. Uh, we would be criticized for not being consistent. Uh, it's true. I mean, my my mandate uh, as a, as a mainly international focus. But when it comes to religious engagement, of course, you will start from home. We, we I mean, we can um, use a, a famous quotation. Uh, we could say that religious engagement begin, begins at home, like, like foreign policy, which means I, I felt the need to build very good relations with religious actors that are in Italy, even before I, I started you know, engaging with, with foreign counterparts. And this is also a consequence of the universal nature of religion. I mean, an, a, an imam that lives in Italy is part of uh, uh, worldwide Islam. And the same goes for, uh, for a rabbi or for a priest and so on. Uh, so the universal nature of religions really I mean, leads us to, to keep this universal uh, Look in what we do. Uh, the second thing is that, of course, uh, for those uh, who have a purely international portfolio, we need to, to be aware of what happens in the country and follow what happens in the country to, to, to make sure that, again, what we do is consistent and we have the full picture of, uh, of what is going on. Um, uh, the EU four guidelines probably uh, fix, uh, uh, to some extent, this uh, this gap between the domestic and the and the international uh, dimension, because it is said at the beginning that the EU itself and EU member states states commit to respect and promote FOB also domestically. This is a key statement that let's say frames the all. Uh, say, work we, we, we do in, in this regard. Then if, uh, if at the domestic level you have different uh, roles, this, this could be natural. I mean, this is what happens in most cases. What is important is to, again, to make sure that there is coordination uh, among these different uh, roles and, and layers, and always keep in mind the consistency need. Thank you very much. Um, so next question comes from Katia Lane. Uh, to further enhance the influence of the EU guidelines on FORP, what are the what challenges of the guidelines implementations do you believe need to be addressed? Well, um, there is a chapter on training, for example. I think the training part uh, uh, could be could be developed much further. And um, training on FOB, on the religious dimension in foreign policy should be part of uh, both our national training, training programs and of uh, training, training programs at, at the EU level. Uh, I believe that the EU, um, that in this regard, the EU level is, is more, probably more advanced than uh, um, compared to what some EU countries uh, do. I believe that uh, also Italy could, uh, could improve in this regard. I would very much like uh, our young people us to, to spend some time during their the training on, uh, on, these, uh, on these topics. In general, the religious dimension of foreign policy is, uh, is becoming more and more relevant, more and more present, uh, but I fear that uh, uh, all these connections are uh, not always, let's say, seen in the seen in the real extent, and uh, and these are missed opportunities that we should uh, that we should fix. Um, yeah, we got just a few more minutes and a few more questions. Uh, hopefully, we can cover them. So David Sates is asking, uh, for example, violence in the Sahel is growing in general terms. And uh, the violence in the region in the region has different drivers, such as climate change, poverty, ethno religious tensions, etc. And so his question is: Does Italy address the increase of violence in the Sahel from a religious angle? Uh, for example, by dealing with religious actors in the region. If yes, could you give an example? And maybe I could also add to that more general question: When we deal with such complex crises, when it's not only about FORP, but more um, about different pressure points in a certain um, in a certain region of the world, 
how do you go about that? How do you as special envoy work on such cases? Yeah, another good question. Uh, well, it's true that uh, for violations uh, do not always raise uh, from a purely religious problem. Sometimes they are the, the, the result of a combination of factors. And this is precisely what, happened, what happens in the Sahel, in Nigeria, in, in a number of African countries. Um, this is why we need a comprehensive approach where religious is that religion is definitely part of the picture, but not the only the only element. Um, this this Sahel case also shows very well the uh, connection between form and development, which runs in both directions. So in this case, you have development issues that have a negative uh, impact on on form levels. We are doing something. We are uh, um, financing a project by uh, Santana School, which is uh, one of the Italian university institutes, which is a, which which has a focus on the empowerment of traditional religious actors in the Sahel as mediator and as a um, player in, in conflict prevention. What we have been seeing in the, in the past few years is that traditional uh, religious leaders have been uh, um, have been sidelined, um, and that other players have been trying to to take uh, to take up their role. And by sidelining uh, traditional religious leaders, uh, we will miss uh, uh, we will miss their contribution as um, as peace builders, as mediators, as people that can. Uh, uh, let's say, reinvigorate that tradition of peaceful coexistence between uh, religious communities that is very typical of the African experience. We have a history of peaceful uh, coexistence of religious communities in Africa that is more and more uh, under pressure because of uh, more recent uh, tensions and conflicts. And supporting and empowering traditional religious leaders is a way to let's say, stem this tide and, um, and uh, achieve uh, our goals of, of stability and, um, and prosperity. So yes, we are working on this. And again, the religious component should be seen in combination with the other factors that are at play. So we, we, also need, uh, we also need peace building, uh, you need the traditional development cooperation, and then you need, of course, to have religious actors fully involved in, uh, in this process. Uh, you are on mute. Yes, I am. I apologize, there was a blank line and I didn't want to disturb you. Um, so the next question is, how do you see the EU as an institution and EU members engaging with International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance? Uh, this alliance has several EU members, but far from all of them. The EU as an institution has not participated to the knowledge of the, um, the person who's asking the question. And this is despite the fact that the EU guidelines and IRFBA founding charts are being very similar. Yeah, uh, yes, to my knowledge, uh, uh, let's say membership so far uh, has been on, um, on a national basis. Um, I know that the, EU, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on FOB is an observer, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Europe. And um, well, yes, uh, not all EU member countries are, uh, are members of IFPA. So I'm, I'm not really uh, you know, very familiar on, with uh, how it works with, I mean, in these cases. If, uh, if the EU itself could be a member of, uh, of an alliance like, uh, like, like IRFPA. So far, it's been conducted I mean, on, a, on a national basis, on a, on, a country, on a country basis. This could be something for, uh, for, the, for the future. I'm not aware of any discussion on this specific point uh, that has been ongoing at the EU level. To be frank. Right. And I'm I'm taking the last question from the uh, question and answer box. Um, have you pre um, if uh, yeah, if it was mentioned, have you produced any sort of curriculum for use when introducing uh, faith 
or four issues into the community programs that you mentioned at the start of your talk? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure this, this is what I... Well, I mean, we, we don't have uh, training programs uh, by ourselves. So uh, I've been working on, uh, on some, you know, yes, framing uh, activities, especially for our, uh, for our embassies abroad. So, I mean, to, to give them the, the main terms of reference of, uh, of religious engagement in general as, a, as part of our work, as a, as a pattern that we can apply, apply to, to different uh, areas of, uh, of activity. Um, I'm trying, of course, to, to keep uh, a regular dialogue with our embassies abroad that, of course, face uh, different situations when it comes to, to the religious landscape in the, uh, in the countries where they, they serve. Um, I mean, working on, a, let's say, more uh, uh, focused uh, tool is definitely one of the ideas uh, I've been having in mind. Uh, for the next few months. Right. Thank you. I will conclude with just one last question because we are already over time. Um, and from your side, from the side of, the, of an official, Andrea, um, can you give us your advice? How can civil society organizations work together with governments, whether it is on the EU level or national governments, uh, to enhance the implementation of the EU guidelines on the protection of work. What is your advice on how we can be effective in helping your work? Well, I mean, uh, um, to put it uh, very simply, I would uh, strongly encourage uh, each and every one of you to, to always engage with us, to always send us inputs, uh, to involve us in your own activities in meetings, in discussions, in uh, outreach activities. I, I think that uh, the more uh, we, we keep in touch with, with one another, the more we work together and the better results we, we can achieve. I think there is uh, possibly no limit to our, uh, uh, let's say, mutual engagement in the work we, we do. For example, Italy as a, as a fund to support Christian minorities in, uh, in crisis areas. And uh, we allocate, uh, um, we allocate these financial resources through uh, yearly course of proposals that are, uh, um, that are addressed to, to NGOs. So this is a very good way to, to work, of course, and to work together. Um, the call for proposals is, uh, is meant only for Italian NGOs, but these Italian NGOs should partner with local NGOs in the country where they are planning to, to conduct these activities, but they can also, they have the possibility to partner with, uh, for example, European NGOs from, from other countries that have a direct knowledge of that, uh, of that uh, say region or country and they're able and willing to work uh, to work with them so there are a, really a number of uh, of activities we we can do together and uh, we should not miss any of these opportunities i believe yeah right thank you well andrea there is just one last question in the q a box maybe if you could uh, briefly uh, respond on that what work are you doing with expatriate people in italy who come from countries with a lot of religious persecution do you see a role for them in helping to address the tensions and conflicts uh, uh, of new refugees, immigrants, etc., and yeah, to bring them to bring it up with them? Well, I I don't have a direct experience. Uh, I hadn't, I didn't have a, any opportunity to let's say engage directly with the with refugee co refugees communities in, in Italy in this past year. Uh, but, uh, for example, I mean, some of them um, are taking part in uh, events on FOB as, um, as witnesses, for example. So to, have, to hear uh, from the voices of those who, who were persecuted is, uh, I think, is a, is a, is a much needed way um, to raise awareness. Say within within the broader the broader audience, and of course, I mean there are different experiences in this regard that uh, 
that should be capitalized upon. And um, in what we do, like part of our religious engagement, we all, always interact with uh, uh, representatives of, let's say, communities that were not there uh, 50 years ago, for example. Italy has become um, much more diverse in the past few years compared to how it used to be, uh, let's say, 50 or 40 years ago. And uh, this also helped help us you know, get a better understanding of what, uh, what happens around the world and uh, of how we can, we can help these people in, uh, I mean, face the challenges uh, they are uh, exposed to. This can definitely be another you know, line of action that I make, may take uh, for the future. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. It has been extremely interesting and very useful to have a conversation with you today. Um, thank you very much on behalf of APRIT and on behalf of everyone who has attended today's interview. Um, yeah, I just want to remind uh, everyone that uh, our next short interview is coming up on the 22nd of June, which will be a conversation with Ari Dipater from the European Evangelical Alliance. Uh, you can see more information and the link to register in the webinar chat. And I also want to remind you of the main event that we are having on the 26th of June on Monday in Brussels, celebrating 10 years of the EU guidelines on the promotion and protection of ORP uh, with two special guests, Mr. Franz van Dale, a special born for, uh, from the EU, and Professor Nazila Ganea, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. You can also find more information um, via if you go via the link posted in the webinar chat. And um, I think I thank you all for attending and wishing you, Andrea, and everyone a very good afternoon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Goodbye.